Thank you. Okay, here's the first joke. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> so, the universe implodes. No matter, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Liam Williams, at your service. It's, um, it's a good joke. It's a bit geeky, that's the only problem. I was always a bit of a geek at school. I used to get bullied for that, but I dealt with it. I always gave as good as I got. In fact, I gave better than I got. Not to the same people, to the smaller boys, the weaker boys. <laughs> and to my family's animals. And that helps. It's nice to be here. My name's Liam. Brown hair, blue eyes, always up for a laugh. I live in uh, North London. I don't really like where I live because I hate my neighbours. My neighbours piss me off all day. Their Wi-Fi connection is so slow. It's just... <laughs> terrible. What a pleasure to be here. How, how did I end up here? How did I end up with my name in lights too many times for no reason? <laughs> how did I, who left school at 16 before going to sick form and university, come to be? <laughs> Standing before you this evening, well, I'll tell you my story. And I'll tell you through the medium of storytelling, just normal, <laughs> normal stand-up. We, we begin in Leeds in 1974, then immediately fast forward 14 years to 1988, the year of my birth. <laughs> my mother is talking to my grandfather, her father and friend. <laughs> Dad, I'm pregnant with the semi-professional comedian Liam Williams. <laughs> oh. Wonderful news. You will, of course, raise him as we raised you, won't you? You mean emotionally repressed and in relative poverty? <laughs> I. <laughs> no, Dad. Why not? Well, Dad, there's this alternative lifestyle we've read about. It's called being lower middle class. <laughs> you what? <sighs> what does that mean? <coughs> it means we'll encourage him to eat three or four portions of vegetables a day and strike him biannually at most. <laughs> we really think this is for the best. Please, Dad, say you understand. But Grandad didn't say he understood. He just turned away and muttered something about his hat. <laughs> My hat. <laughs> My parents did give me a good upbringing, but they were the kind of parents who would always remind me I was having a good upbringing. They'd say, Liam, we fed you, we've clothed you, we put a roof over your head. I'd say, well, I am grateful for those things, mother and father, but if you didn't do them, I think you'd have to deal with the police at the door, asking why there's a starving naked boy on the front lawn. <laughs> I hated school too. I hated the head teacher, Mr. Dickhead. I can still remember <laughs> Mr. Dickhead. Stand up straight, Liam. Tuck your shirt in. Take that dead bird out your mouth. People think you've no self respect. What do I care? What do I care, I'd say. Don't you know no actually matters? We're all going to be bukkakied with sadness when the banks start to collapse anyway. <laughs> it was only 2004 and I was only 16, but I'm very prescient. It's a bit more respect from some of you, I think. I was a little prick, and uh, like most little pricks, I began experimenting with drugs as a superficial act of teenage rebellion. Not proud of that. I fear my drug use may have begun to catch up with me. Now I get memory loss and flashbacks, sometimes at the same time, which is just normal. <laughs> just normal consciousness. I was worried also for a while that I'd begun hearing voices in my head. But then I thought maybe hearing voices in your head is just thinking. <laughs> Not necessarily. We all have an interior monologue. Our thoughts are made of language. It just depends what that voice in your head is saying. If you walk down a street, a voice in your head says, oh, look at that dead bird. Then you're saying, I think. But if you walk down the street, the voice in your head says, oh, eat that dead bird. Then that's the... Sus <laughs> just keep an eye on the commands. <laughs> you're getting That's my only... Advice. Listen, I know it's an unsavory topic for some people. I've taken drugs in the past. I may have taken drugs in the future. I don't know. I haven't been there yet. <laughs> I can't wait to find out, but there are some drugs I've vowed never to touch again. Cocaine, for example, awful and pretty prevalent in the television and comedy industries, shrinks the penis to the size of a walnut and inflates the ego to the size of a walnut. <laughs> Considering the human ego is a purely abstract, metaphorical entity, for it to reach walnut size is pretty worrying, I think. <laughs> I worry most of all that drug use has left me permanently depressed permanently lazy. These are like my main two modes, my main two characteristics as a person. Now, laziness and depression, not an ideal combination of main characteristics. I have considered suicide, but only in the same way I've considered going for a jog every day for the last five or six years. <laughs> I'm never going to get round to it. <laughs> I haven't got the get up and go. 
need to get my shit together. You know that phrase, fashionable phrase, it's fashionable as shoulder pads and little illustrations of mustaches. I need to get my shit together. I realize my shit is all asunder. I need to stoop down, gather it up enthusiastically like I'm scrumping fallen apples. Like, ball it up tight and be like, look world, there's my shit. It's together. There are a number of inciting incidents that led me to these realizations and I'll tell you the one of greatest narrative interest. This girl came back to my flat and we made, well, not love, but the requisite levels of mutual trust to concede our bodies to each other and escape our respective states of loneliness for a little while. <laughs> we made sweet that. <laughs> and this, I'm gonna say, this isn't a standard fuck boast nor um, a cliched self-deprecating tale of sexual failure. I'm fine as lovers go. Not fine as in, oh, what a fine lover you are. Fine as in, how was that for you? It's fine. <laughs> It's fine, isn't it? It's all basically fine. I just do it for the post-coital epiphanies, really. That's my... <laughs> That's my thing. I'll be laying a bed, the bedroom bathed in sodium light from the street lamp outside. Not physically, but psychologically alone. <laughs> Empty and still. Until suddenly I'll be like, yeah, I should make my own lemonade. <laughs> Well, I never do. <laughs> anyway, this is one of those ongoing, semi-frequent things that's never gonna develop into love because we just don't respect each other enough. You, know, you can be as close with someone as two mammals could ever be. In some... I guess we just realized we have roughly the same sexual market value and just embarked on this unrewarding cycle. <laughs> which is fine, like it allows a kind of uh, detached candor which is important to this story. And the other important detail is that she's stylish, this girl, in, in a way that I don't have the critical vocabulary to describe. She looks like a little sailor on this particular occasion. If that gets anything across, that's the best I can do. <laughs> this little sailor has never been to my flat before. And afterwards, she's abed and looking around the room, I guess just collecting data to take away with her and use to assess the extent to which she's selling herself short in these transactions. <laughs> After about a minute of looking at the room's four walls, she turns to me and goes, hey, how long have you lived here now? I'm like, about two years, two and a half years, why? And she goes, what? Looks like you've been here a week or so. I say, what do you mean? And she says, well, you've got things here, but there's no design to it. It's like your room doesn't have a personality. And as a joke to imply self-assurance, I say, that's because I don't have a personality. <laughs> and the contrived earnestness in her voice when she replies, that's not true, Liam. <laughs> it's made me quite scared. <laughs> so now I want money and things, things on or near me to imply a personality. Because sometimes when I'm talking to people, I'll see them realize that behind the jokes and the attempts at cleverness and that, there's just not really very much there. I want things not as status symbols, but as decoys and distractions so that when I realize it's happening, I can be like, ah, look at my on-trend boat shoes. <laughs> look at my leather-bound iPad case. I'm gonna get an iPad to go in there one of these days. <laughs> Hand me a MasterCard and this month's GQ magazine. And darling, when the bedroom is full of sodium light and the abyss yawns over the trees, do not stare at it, nor at the bare ceiling and presume me bare too. But look instead at this poster of skyscraper builders in the olden days, eating their lunch on a beam. <laughs> and my massive iPod dock, and my collection of unusual beer bottles from around the world. <laughs> Life in the big city getting me down. The endless grey, the day-to-day, -day, the daily grind. In a city of such apparently infinite variety, the same faces and places reoccur as if your life is just a Vine video, a GIF file. Endlessly cycling. Catch a glimpse of yourself in the dark tube glass every evening on the way home. You don't notice time ravaging you, but you don't notice the shadow of the sundials slowly crawling round either. That's because there aren't many sundials around anymore, but you're, you're all dying. That's what I'm trying to put across, I think. It's monotonous. Same thing every day. Wake up, have a cup of tea. Go back to bed for a few hours, get up again. <laughs> Have a slow breakfast, another cup of tea. Go on YouTube for about four hours. Try and do some work, give up. Have another cup of tea, go on YouTube again. Have a bath, have another cup of tea. Just basically a life mitigated by 
endless cups of tea. And then as another evening curls itself around the shard, you go for dinner, go to the cinema with your friends, go for a drink, go for another drink, go home, watch an episode of The American Office you've illegally downloaded, watch another episode of The American Office you've illegally downloaded, get up, do it all again, repeat, ad infinitum. But at the weekend, go to the beautiful coast again. Fucking bullshit. Like, <laughs> fucking Sisyphus, man. You're gonna do whatever you can to inject a bit of fun into it, because even the supposedly funnest things can become ritualistic, like dating. I want to read you this article now, which uh, exemplifies what I mean about injecting fun into life. I'm playing the dating game at the moment. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I thought games were supposed to be fun. Well, sometimes I think I'd rather be playing Jumanji. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. That would be horrid. <laughs> Dating's no picnic either. So I just want to read this article about alternative dating ideas from a popular London lifestyle listings magazine. Alternative dating ideas for Londoners. It's pretty London-centric, but you'll probably get some of this stuff out in the provinces in a couple of years as well. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to read it. Could you play the, the romantic music, please? Okay. Looking for innovative dating ideas this weekend? Well, you should be, you fucking little rat. <laughs> Everybody your age group and socioeconomic bracket is dating, so you should be too, you waste of sperm. <laughs> Here are our top 10 alternative dating ideas for Londoners. Number one, a salsa class. Learn how to make salsa at one of London's many salsa schools. <laughs> Number two, comedy on a bus. Laughter can be a perfect icebreaker on a first date, but on a bus? This is comedy like you've never experienced it before. Three, pebble washing in the Thames. The Thames Museum runs free workshops where every Sunday, budding pebble washers, or Jeffreys as they used to be called for no reason, can take to the horrible riverbank and wash the pebbles in baby oil, which is like sunflower oil, but extracted from babies. <laughs> When the 16-hour session is finished, why not relax by a burning pile of bin bags with a steaming bowl of alive mice? <laughs> Number four, a tour of the tube. We take the tube for granted. We ride it to and from work each day, and when we get home, we cry. But the tube is full of amazing hidden secrets. Did you know some of the stations are very old? Ride around on the tube together and bring a wry smile to your date's face by showing them the Nemi cartoon in that day's Metro. Number five, jazz on a roof. Tapping along to the crazy rhythms of jazz can be the perfect icebreaker on a first date, but on a roof? This is jazz like you've never experienced it before. Six, a Cayley. For a taste of the Celtic, why not pay a Scottish or Irish woman called Cayley to let you have a bite of her body? <laughs> Seven, cocktails in a tree. Zesty fruit and frontal lobe numbing alcohol can be the perfect icebreaker on a first date, but on a tree? <laughs> this is a cocktail experience like you've never had before, nor ever will want to have again. Eight, visit the National Gallery. Nine, karaoke in a bin, blah, blah, blah. 10, a sewer walk. Without permission or supervision, climb into London's sewer system <laughs> and take a look around. But be warned, you'll die. I hope that was illuminating. I, I should go. I... That's it. Thanks. Thanks for having me, and uh, have a good have a good night. Thanks. Cheers.